Good evening. My name is Mark Sutherland and I'm the rector here at St. Martin's and I'm joined for this interfaith Thanksgiving service by colleagues from other faith traditions on the East Side. I have Jamie Washam from First Baptist and Rebecca Spencer from uh, Central Congregational, uh, Michael Fell from Temple Emmanuel, and my colleague across the street, Sarah Matt from Temple Beth Al. Many of you will be used to attending this interfaith Thanksgiving service each year. Uh, and because of the pandemic, this now has to be a pre-recorded service. And those of you who are familiar from the struggles within your own faith communities to adapt to the new demands of virtual worship, I hope that this will be a satisfying experience for you tonight. The East Side Interfaith Thanksgiving service uh, originates in the Abrahamic Accord, which was a vibrant conversation uh, between Jewish and Christian communities here on the East Side uh, during the 90s and the early 2000s. And this annual service is what is left of that conversation. We're all optimistic now with changes of leadership in some of our institutions that we might begin to more creatively revive that conversation within which this wonderful annual interfaith event uh, will continue to take place. So I don't know whether it's appropriate for me to say, sit back and put your feet up and uh, enjoy the show. In the groundswell of our hearts, we hum quiet melodies at day's end. In the living of life, we shall be measured by love. We hum melodies of gratefulness, the music of gratitude. In the living of life, we shall be measured by love. We bring to our thanksgiving prayer all the small ones of this world who have no voice of their own knowing that we must learn to be a voice for the voiceless. In the living of life, we shall be measured by love. As we become a part of this music of thanksgiving, we are aware that the more deeply we enter the song of praise, the more truly we become the song. In the living of life, we shall be measured by love. Look upon us in this time of pandemic and color our faces with the radiance of your love that we may see one another more clearly. Let the incense of our gratitude rise as our hearts become full of all that was given to us to enjoy that we may be thankful stewards of all of creation. Amen.
This first text is taken from the book of Deuteronomy. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance to possess, and you possess it and settle in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground, which you harvest from the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for God's name. You shall go to the priest who is in office at that time and say to them, Today I declare to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our ancestors to give to us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground to you, O Lord, have given me. You shall set it down before the Lord your God and bow down before the Lord your God. Then you, together with the Levites and the aliens who reside among you, shall celebrate with all the bounty that the Lord your God has given to you and to your house. A reading from The Gift of Sufficiency by Lynn Twist, co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance. We each have a choice in any setting to step back and let go of the mindset of scarcity. Once we have let go of scarcity, we discover the surprising truth of sufficiency. And by sufficiency, I don't mean a quantity of anything. Sufficiency isn't an amount at all. It is an experience, a context we generate, a declaration, a knowing that there is enough and that we are enough. When we live in the context of sufficiency, we find a natural freedom and integrity. We engage in life from a sense of our own wholeness rather than a desperate longing to be complete. We feel naturally called to share the resources that flow through our lives, our time, our money, our wisdom, our energy, at whatever level these resources flow to serve our highest commitments. Sufficiency as a way of being offers us enormous personal freedom and possibility. Rather than scarcity's myths that tell us that the only way to perceive the world is there's not enough, or more is better, and that's just the way it is, the truth of sufficiency asserts that there is enough for everyone. Knowing that there is enough inspires sharing, collaboration, and contribution. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
for I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these of my brothers and sisters, you did for me. Each year at this service, we invite a representative from a community agency who are working to meet the needs of a section of underserved people in our community. And so this year, it is our great pleasure to welcome Patrick Westfall, who is the co-executive director of Open Doors Rhode Island, an agency that is working with the rehabilitation uh, and return to uh, as active members of society of those who have been incarcerated. The interview you're about to see took place at Open Doors, Rhode Island. Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about the work you do here at Open Doors? So one of the biggest things that's missing for individuals as they come out of the prison system is opportunities. Um, you know, I like to say that everybody coming out of prison and everybody in the community wants the same thing. They want uh, stable employment, they want housing, they want people to just kind of get their lives back together and become productive members of society. But what we found is a lot of people, the, what the community really focused on, we want everyone to get a job. We want everyone to get housing. What some people in the community want is we want people to get employment somewhere else. We want them to get housing somewhere else. And as a, as a society, we've enacted all these barriers to what people who are coming out of prison can and can't do. And you know, I, I firmly believe the hardest part of someone's prison sentence actually starts the day they walk out. You know, they're going into job interviews and they have to worry, is there is their criminal record going to prevent them from getting a job? Is it going to prevent them from getting housing? You know, is it going to prevent them from going to school? Uh, so Open Doors in 2003 was kind of uh, formed between a partnership between the community, the faith-based community, and the Department of Corrections to help provide some of those opportunities. So we're working with people trying to help them find stable housing, stable employment, and we realize that it's a process. You don't just walk out of prison and get a you know, $35 an hour job. For some of our clients, it's about helping them find you know, their first job. They might be 50 years old, but they've never worked an honest job in their life. So it's about helping them you know, find the job, apply for the job. Uh, I think of a client that we worked with, he was released last December, and his last job was when he was active duty in Vietnam. Uh, so he's trying to apply for jobs, but he's never used a computer in his life before. So it's, it's not just, hey, go apply for a job. It's actually sitting down with him, helping him open an email address, use the email address, apply for the job. You know, sometimes one of the things that's challenging for men and women that go to prison is when you go to prison, your life stops. But the rest of the world keeps moving, and it moves on without you. And people feel like, sometimes they feel like they're getting left behind or getting forgotten. You know, so one of the things that we do at Open Doors is about establishing that trust with the client. Um, and quickly establishing the trust and getting them to say, look, we're on your side. We know you've been through a lot. We know you're going to go through a lot to get where you want to be. But we're here to walk beside you. We have, you know, employees like Corinne and Brenda. You know, we're walking, we're not just saying, hey, do this, do this. It's, we're working with the clients. We're standing next to them. We're going to court with them. You know, uh, I can think of many times I'm taking a client to a job interview and we're practicing on the way and I'm sitting in the, in the parking lot actually, you know, saying prayers for them as they're in there doing that job interview because I know the impact that just 
that part-time minimum wage job, the impact it can have on somebody's, not just their financial circumstances, but I think about how good it feels to go to work every day. You know, I, there are days I don't want to go to work. It's part of normal life, but I have some place to go. I have a job to go to, and I know how important that is to me and how important it becomes to our clients. I've had clients, you know, in our transitional houses. Uh, you can see the change from before the job interview to after the job offer. They're an entirely different person. Patrick, what's the history of Open Doors? How, how does it come about? So in 2003, uh, partners in the community said, look, we have this high number of individuals coming back to, to particularly South Providence, and we're watching them, they get out, and they go back. They get out of prison, they go back to prison. The recidivism rate, it was just this revolving door, and part of what was missing was an opportunities. Um, an agency out there that works exclusively with men and women that have been incarcerated. You know, that's the only thing that we do. Um, in 2006, one of our biggest campaigns, we were the first state to change that by a constitutional referendum. The, the state voted to allow full restoration of voting rights to anybody the day they walk out of prison. So as long as you're not in prison in Rhode Island, you can vote. In 2010, we opened our building in Plainfield Street in Providence. It is the first and actually still the only public housing complex that's strictly dedicated to men and women with criminal records. Um, there's not too many housing complexes you have to have a criminal record to get into. Um, so it's Section 8's low-income housing. We're able to get past the criminal record barriers that a lot of other housing agencies have. Uh, and then since then, we've also opened two transitional houses where we're working with men and women who are directly coming out of prison. Um, in our house in Pawtucket, we have individuals that will get paroled right to our house. We pick them up at the prison. Uh, a lot of times they get a GPS bracelet put on them. And we actually ended up opening a second transitional house in Providence, uh, where we get them working with uh, men and women, or just men who are directly coming out of the prison system, who are still looking for stable housing. One of the challenges with housing, especially in Providence, is it's so expensive. If you're working a, even a full-time minimum wage job, odds are you can't afford an apartment by yourself. Um, uh, so we're really trying to provide those most basic needs, the food, the housing, the clothing, the shelter, uh, and then they can kind of move up from there. Patrick, we can hear that you have a heart for this work. Uh, we can hear your passion. Uh, where does that come from? So my passion for this work, actually, it comes from my own experiences. You know, Open Doors was the first place I came to when I was released from prison in 2010. Uh, it was actually my first job. I started here as a, as a janitor in 2011. Um, and then I've just, it's, it's, op it's given me the opportunity to feel normal again. And then because I was given the opportunity to feel normal again, you know, I decided, all right, I didn't want to be a janitor for the rest of my life. I went to grad school, I got a graduate degree, and then I've kind of just worked in a lot of positions at Open Doors, and I've been here almost 10 years now. And I know what it takes to be in prison one day and be on the streets the next day and have no idea where you're gonna go, no idea where you wanna go, no idea what I can and can't do, and constantly being told, I can't do this, can't do this, Open Doors says, wait, you can do this. This is what you can do, and this is what you can do. This is what we're gonna help you do.
God of abundant grace, your love preserves us and calls us to wakefulness and compassion. We raise our hearts in thankfulness and praise. You, O God, call all the stars by their names and set them dancing overhead to our wonder and delight. You teach the birds their songs that lighten our hearts and call us to joy. May we tend to the earth and to each other with steadfastness and gratitude, always seeing your imprint, O Lord, wherever we look. May we treasure friends and loved ones companions and fellow travelers on this earth, and reach out to those around us in love and kindness. May we seek to mend the wounds we have created and forgive those who have hurt us. May we ever cultivate being honorable and compassionate, being just while loving mercy and grace, seeking purity while acknowledging our humanity. Holy One, Send your angels to tend to those who call upon you and depend upon your care, especially those away from home and those whose needs we place before you, that your peace, surpassing all our understanding, may be our embodied prayer. invite you to bow your heads to receive the ancient Aaronic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. The Lord bless you and keep you. Ya'er Adonai panave lecha v'yichunecha. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yisa Adonai panave lecha v'yasem lecha shalom. The Lord lift up the countenance of his face and give you peace. Amen.